From KCRW and KCRW.com, I'm Michael Silverblatt, and welcome to Bookworm. Today, my guest is Jonathan Lethem. He's the author, most recently, of The Ecstasy of Influence. It's a collection of his nonfiction, his personal essays, his reviews, his diaries and journals. It's a kind of autobiographical work composed out of the readings and the essays he wrote about hitchhiking to California when before he was even a beginning writer. And it's very inspired, it's very lively, and it's very funny. What do you think makes for lively literary writing? Oh, boy. Well, um, thanks, thanks, Michael, for the, for the high praise. I mean, you know, my model for this book, the thing I kind of wanted to um, aim at was... Um, what what um, Kurt Vonnegut calls in Palm Sunday, uh, naming that book an autobiographical collage, but I I had especially in mind Norman Mailer's version of the autobiographical collage uh, advertisements for myself, which is a kind of contentious and and uh, anxious book. He's really trying to define or redefine his his sense of himself and his purpose as a writer at the point that he put it together. Um, another another example that that that. Uh, spoke to me was uh, Cortazar. Uh, Julio Cortazar has a book called Around the Day in 80 Worlds, which, you know, makes a kind of book out of innumerable, tiny, disparate, kind of centrifugal um, fragments and somehow does make it uh, into something not just larger than than the sum of its parts, but larger than the usual sort of book. It becomes a kind of giant Rorschach blot, uh, something you can uh, go at from many angles and, and, and find different things reflected there at different times. Let's paint a picture for our listeners, Jonathan. Let's make a composite portrait of the artist as a young or no longer young man. Not so young. <laughs> a not so young man. Um, because... Mailer really is trying to strut his stuff. He's around as ego-bound the way other people are muscle-bound <laughs> in advertisements for myself. Yeah. Um, Cortazar wants to be, what, a hell of a Joe, a, a really good guy <laughs> yeah. who can fit in anywhere. Uh, among the amazing things you find in what I consider to be his slouch books, he even mentions a poem he found by our local poet, Jim Crusoe. Uh -huh. You know, you don't know where he found it, yeah. a literary magazine, but the sense that what? A writer is someone who's picking up things to read everywhere, and when he gets a chance to, praising him, mentioning him in um, little essays that delight and surprise. Well, you know, one of the reasons I started this book with that sequence of reminiscences about working in used bookstores was that I, I wanted, of course, to reconnect with that part of my life and, and I don't know, somehow trap it in amber and, and return to it myself. But I also thought that my manner of writing and reading and operation as a, as a published author, which I've had the luck of becoming, isn't so different in a way from this kind of browser's, uh, what's the term, the browser's ecstasy that Jeffrey O'Brien names, where you're always, as you say, just kind of looking for the next thing that turns you on and, and uh, gives you the little bit of juice that you need to uh, go through your day and write something else and that you, you know, buttonhole the first person you saw and say, you won't believe what I just read. So this book has that quality of being my presiding over a collection, you know, of, of moments of encounters with cultural stuff that, uh, you know, I couldn't quit thinking about, that, that never stopped uh, being charged that way for me. That young man, as he gets older and better known, gets to nab assignments. I'm in a state of wonder about the time you got to spend with James Brown, yeah. you know, in studio. <laughs> I still um, am in a state of wonder about it myself. <laughs> um, you know, hearing him woo and shriek and slide across the floor and address you as Rolling Stone. Mr. Rolling Stone was his nickname for me. <laughs> and, um, you know, so that it's not just the thing anymore that you found by accident on some shelf somewhere. It's being alive and walking around in the world and telling people about what you're seeing and doing. Well, you know, one of the strange things for me is that I, I, I came into these roles, these various roles that it kind of um, attached to my life as a novelist, uh, 
inadvertently. I never really thought about what I would do after I began writing short stories and novels, partly because I never expected to be offered assignments like those. I thought I was going to be a kind of a perennial dark horse and, you know, um, publish paperback originals or, or you know, mid, mid-list novels when there was still such a thing in hardcover, but but not uh, not get to play this strange uh, fantasy role of the, you know, the the novelist who is therefore uh, expected to weigh in on political things or be a, a great cultural commentator. I didn't visualize this aspect of the assignment. And so I've, I'm always thinking of those things as secretly fictional occasions. And in fact, the chance to, you know, go <laughs> go hang out with James Brown was a really weird uh, byproduct of having written a novel called The Fortress of Solitude, where my semi-autobiographical character is given the career of a music writer. And I guess I sort of fooled people because what happened was after that book came out, the 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 protagonist reminded so many people of me that they began to project uh, uh, mistakenly that they'd read my work in Rolling Stone over the years. And this even occurred, I think, in the offices of Rolling Stone where they were so persuaded that they <laughs> thought, well, we've got to get him back in our pages. Well, I, in fact, I'd never done music writing. But suddenly I was given the very plum, you know, the, the most impossibly, uh, you know, special assignment you could you could get from them to go and hang out with Bob Dylan or James Brown. And, and I think it was only halfway through it that they realized I had <laughs> no chops as a journalist whatsoever. Now, you talk about the Mount Rushmore of literary achievement, and it's usually four big graven heads. Right. Um, and they were, you know, for years and years and years, John Updike, Philip Roth, Saul Bellow, Norman Mailer, with Norman Mailer as the objectionable outpost, <laughs> yeah. the fringe into the Yeah, he was the, the, the pro- problem character. Yes, and the problem child. And it's Andrew Jackson way. had snuck onto Rushmore, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and now we're talking 30 years later, and those are still the people who would appear on a list of the American Rushmore. Why haven't we tended to put up those presidential figures, new young writers taking their place. Well, I, you know, I, I, I guess I, I'm sort of arching an eyebrow at the whole procedure, and I think it's it's fallen apart or or become uh, a a kind of a weird uh, frozen cartoon of itself for mostly very good reasons. Uh, you know, the, those those four, you know, or you know, some earlier quartet or or grouping. You know, if you might have. Uh, projected a little further back and figured that that bunch was replacing what the kind of Hemingway, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, you know, maybe with uh, Nathaniel West as a secret uh, dark horse fourth, uh, you know, that that this was a a really problematic uh, uh, desire in the first place to have a, a, a presidential quartet etched in stone at the foreground of American literary Thinking it doesn't really mean anything. It's it's always falling short of, of you know where the real um, excitement for genuine readers would be, which is uh, in and amongst all those characters there are a thousand others, and of course it becomes extremely problematic that the desire is always to have uh, somehow these these white males, you know, leading the band when you know so often it wasn't really. Uh, the case anymore. And so, you know, when you see people kind of auditioning, uh, why can't we look at uh, whomever? Uh, why can't we look at Jeffrey Eugenides with the same, uh, you know, with, with the same statuesque grandeur as, as we did, you know, uh, Updike or, or, or Bello? I think that actually it's, it's this, this uh, energy is dissolved for good reason and that it's, it's a, quite a silly procedure to begin with. I think it's also that There were so many monuments at a certain point. Literature had grown up somehow and produced monuments with clockwork regularity, books that were even self-consciously monumental, like Ulysses, and that there was a yearning for secret books. You know, I don't know what your secrets are, but our job, if we go into the literary world, is to say, huh, have you read We Think the World of You? And right. Who wrote well, that? Well, you're, you're, you're definitely, you know, p- 
playing my tune here. I always had this uh, weird sideways predilection for, you know, if everyone was uh, excited about uh, James Joyce, I, I, I would want to be reading Flan O'Brien instead. And and that somehow the, the, the obvious was never as uh, nourishing for me as the, the kind of uh, the secret, you know, dark horse uh, characters and candidates, partly because, you know, you can gain a sense of the monumental history, the, the edifice of great books by inference. Everyone's talking about them. All the other writers are writing either in reaction to them or in emulation of them. You can more or less read Ulysses without reading it by reading a uh, hundred other novels that no one else might have uh, discovered that, that all, you know, create a, a negative space around which Ulysses is, uh, is projected. I'm talking to Jonathan Leatham about his collection, The Ecstasy of Influence, and part of it is a reminder that the impulse to write and to read is to have secrets, find secrets, share secrets. So I want to invite anyone who listens to come to kcrw.com slash bookworm and comment on this show by sharing some of your secret favorite books, the books other people don't know. You mention a couple in this, one by Thomas Berger that I haven't read. Is it Berger or Berger? I, I always say Berger, but, and I think that's how he says it, but since we, we've never met, only written letters, I can't <laughs> can't promise you that that's right. Um, I love Berger, and, and a few of his books, I think, are, you know, among the great overlooked masterworks of the, the you know, the post-war landscape, like Killing Killing Time um, and the Reinhardt books. and, and uh, Well, I've got to tell you, I'm still crazy about Little Big Man. No one reads it anymore. Even his big blockbuster, if you can call it that, yeah. is an overlooked book. But it is. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a it's, towering book. It's and a thrilling book, funny and generous and wild and admiring of Native American culture and of our own culture. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one of the reasons Berger is, is so exciting, I think, is that he's one of those uh, uh, termite readers. He's always discovering some new thing he's excited about and his own reading is very uh, eccentric and passionate and and his understanding of you know uh, American literary history he's you know he's he's reading howls and 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 you know uh, he's got his own secret books and they are recapitulated in his work I mentioned Ackerley and on the air I've mentioned Jane Bowles before yeah. and I'm you know there there are so many writers that I'm crazier about who you haven't heard of. I'm crazier about the unknowns yeah. than the knowns. And I feel like this new book, The Ecstasy of Influence, is an attempt on your part, Jonathan Leatham, to redirect people who may have thought that the winning of a Pulitzer Prize or the appearance on a bestseller list meant that you were on your way to monumenthood, but that you <laughs> want to reconnect with your roots as a person who worked in used bookstores, who found secret books, who went to the movies and loved the best unusual ones, the cultishness of this project seems to be resurrected here. Well, I, you know, I, I, I hope it isn't uh, only originating in some anxious uh, attempt to appear uh, cool rather than stolid, but really it's, you know, it's a compendium of my enthusiasms. It's simply... Uh, a spilling forth of things that are, you know, the the paving stones on the road that got me to this weird situation of having people ask me what I care about or 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 why I write or how I write the way I do. This is an honest attempt at a reply. Um, I you know what I find so fascinating is the way. Um, I mean, I, when I first got into G.K. Chesterton, uh, it was a Penguin paperback. I didn't understand that I was decorating myself with something obscure. I thought it was part of the canon. And, you know, in a sense it was. Uh, the Man Who Was Thursday is a famous book, except no one reads it. 